Hey, this is Raul from Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the great honor and pleasure of having a chance to chat with the authors of the bass book, the a complete illustrated history of bass guitars, Tony Bacon and Barry Morehouse. And for those of you that are starting, you will notice that um, Tony is is the one person you see that's actually moving. There we go. That's Tony. And I've got a, a still up of Barry as we run into a few technical difficulties. But a book of this caliber is so important that we felt we must press on and, and get this going so that uh, our readership yourselves could, you know, hear more about this. So kind of starting from the beginning, the edition that I have here is actually the third edition of this yeah. book. The original being released in 1995. So this has been a 21 year project and it's Great. kind of ongoing. Um, how did we, how did you guys come up with the idea of doing a base book? Well, um, I, I've been um, writing and publishing books for a few years by the time that 95 came around. Um, I started out writing for magazines in the kind of mid-70s and 80s. And then come the 90s, um, it doesn't always work in decades, but <laughs> some things do, fortunately. Um, come the 90s, I got the opportunity to um, produce a book called uh, The Ultimate Guitar Book. Uh, very unprepossessing name, um, and that came out in '91. And Nigel Osborne, who I did the book with, uh, he and I decided that we would start to publish our own books. Um, so that's what happened. Um, and we started with a couple of guitar titles. And being a bass player originally, I had always wanted to write about the history of the bass it hadn't been done i thought it was potentially a really good story um i'd known barry for a long time uh we go back uh, certainly to the 80s um and he and i hooked up and talked about it um, uh, and that's how this oh well, actually i had a problem well, there we are There's, that's that's the first first edition first the book. yeah so it was a hardback originally uh, a little smaller format but um, that's where it all began. That's about right, Barry, isn't it, I think? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Raul, my involvement was that, <clears throat> as Tony had said, um, he was the uh, writer, um, and um, we, <clears throat> we had started in the mid-'80s, in the beginning of '84. We'd started essentially the first high-profile bass guitar-only store uh, in the world possibly um, and that started out in London and we ended up by the mid 90s with shops in Birmingham, Manchester and Los Angeles um, and so um, we had a different type of base experience to uh, Tony but uh, putting um, our experiences together and his knowledge meant that I think we were a reasonable force to be able to document that history and it's it's i think it's very exciting at multiple points number one electric bass is a relatively young instrument when you look at in comparison to so many of the classical instruments i mean the upright bass has been around for a way longer time but we are living during this time this early time in history. And uh, I didn't know if you knew, but Bass Musician Magazine has is in the process, it's ongoing, we started in January, of celebrating the year of the Luthier. And as I look at the evolution of the electric bass as an instrument, there's kind of, it's kind of a, a, a tripod of factors that have influenced this progression one of those being the initial inventive uh, spirit with uh, Leo Fender. Uh, I know Paul Tutmark uh, doesn't get as much credit, perhaps. Um, I've actually had the great honor 
of holding one of Tootmark's bases and getting a closer look at it, but it's rather an obscure a branch off of the tree. And then another factor being that of industry and business, how it has made the evolution of the instrument progress. And then thirdly, the needs and the requirements of the music itself, which has lent itself. And all of these had to overlap in order for this growth and this progress to happen. And so as we are living through this time in history, to be able to document it, it's perfect because mm -hmm. it's ongoing. But by the same token, as you look at the early years and when the first book was done, um, how has, like, now this is the third edition. How, I'm sure the book itself has had to evolve. How, how has that happened? Well, yeah, it has evolved. Um, I mean, not just in the look of it. I mean, you held up the other edition, but uh, I, I, yes, I have the I have the new one. Yeah. Well, I mean, if I put them by side by side, I mean, yes. you can see that, 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 that <laughs> the size has changed somewhat, sure. um, and format has changed a little bit. But um, we, I think, we wanted to when, when we when we did the first edition, it was um, it was kind of. It was kind of uncharted territory in some ways. I mean, obviously there had been other books about books about the guitar kind of often put the bass in as a footnote. And it's like, oh, and Leo also made a precision bass. Let's move on to the Strat. You know? yes. um, and, and Barry and I both found that a bit frustrating and we wanted to, to put that right, really. Um, and, but we also, I, I think you make a good point about the development being in the hands of players, we, we really wanted to show how players had influenced the story all the way along the line. Um, that's what you would expect, I suppose, but it doesn't always happen with other instruments. You know, that I think there's, there's sometimes there can be a kind of a, a, a split in the road and, and, a, and, a, and a maker will go one way and players will go another way. And then suddenly the, the maker will go, hold on, we're, we're, <laughs> we're going adrift here. Fender has done it in its history. It's gone adrift. Players have said, "Well, actually, no. What you really need to be doing is this, and pull them back onto course." Um, so we we really wanted to show how that story had uh, how the, the two had interlinked, really, the story of the makers and the story of the players, and how that was sometimes harmonious and sometimes wasn't, you know, and with 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 different different results as a, uh, because of that. Yeah. I think also, um, you'll have to forgive me if I jump in at any time uh, oh, incorrectly because I can't see anybody. I think the point uh, that you made, Raoul, uh, which is being answered by Tony, also the point that you made that it's a relatively young instrument. Mm -hmm. So what was very interesting for Tony and I um, was the fact that we were able to call on some of these people who'd been involved with Leo in the early days uh, I went over to where literally Leo worked at the end of his career uh, when we took a, photo, a photographer over to the States. Um, and interestingly enough, we, we did have the displeasure of coming together on several occasions when somebody had died. Oh, no. And this is an awful thing to say, but it, I'm just trying to um, amplify the fact that all these guys, a lot of them were still around. So we were able to record this history uh, from 95 onwards uh, in real time, essentially, for, with, with interviews with a lot of people. Uh, would you agree with that, Tony? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we, we felt that we wanted to, well, we wanted to speak to as many people as we could, but obviously you have to be selective. <laughs> and that kind of, it's a limitation, but it's also an opportunity, I think. I mean, certainly amongst the players, we were, we were very lucky to get Paul McCartney to speak to us. I mean, and that was, I, <laughs> I contacted a number of people with uh, with the idea of interviewing, and I thought, well, I'd give McCartney a shot, and I didn't for a minute think that we would actually get to him, but we did. Um, I don't know, maybe he just got out of bed the right way that morning, but yeah, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Who knows what happens in the world of Paul McCartney? But sure. uh, he, I was told by somebody at his office, actually, that he, he did the interview because he likes to be, he will, he's much more likely to do something where he's seen amongst his peers. He's not so keen on being 
<laughs> it sounds odd for, to say that Paul McCartney, but he's not so keen to be seen as the focus. It's very keen to be seen as the focus in other circumstances. Yes. But he, he likes to be seen amongst his peers, and, and certainly we <laughs> we uh, underlined that that would be the case. He was he was part a very important part, I think, of the history of bass. Um, certainly pointed the, pointed the direction for a lot of people that followed and and underlined the fact that the bass guitar is a very um well it's a very seductive instrument and it's um but used properly it can it can change the course of a piece of music it's it's um and he i mean he said in the interview you know you, you suddenly when you start playing you suddenly realize the power that you have as a bass player um and he said it's not vengeful power, or at least he wasn't using it that way. <laughs> it's it's just the power that you have and you, and you recognise uh, and you use appropriately. So that that was a, in when we were doing the first edition of the book. That was absolutely the high spot when we went down to McCartney's studio and spent two or three hours with him. And I said we sat down and I said. Um, I'm going to have to ask this as the first question. Do, do you mind talking about the Beatles? Because remember, this was 95. Um, I had no idea whether that was a good subject in his mind at that time or a bad subject or whatever. And he, he said, I love talking about the Beatles. Carry on. And we did it for two, two or three months, and it was wonderful. And equally, we were, we were very fortunate uh, to have access to the whole of John Entwistle's collection, who was a good mate. And so he basically said, you know, just root through them all. And there's a lot of photographs of his instruments in um, in the book, which I think is particularly apt in the fact that if you consider in the 60s, when there was McCartney was a strong force, most guys were playing root and fifth and having half that recorded wrongly, whereas... Entwistle was playing solos on hit singles. He was so far ahead of his time. So if you consider that, you know, some of the instruments and the input was from the likes of Pino Palladino, John Entwistle, um, Paul McCartney, there's a Brit influence. But let's be honest about it, that influence in the 60s, which came over to America, was where it all um, was very strong anyway in, in the beat boom. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and it's 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 interesting that confluence because that's where the the way that music has evolved, especially with rock, that I think has brought the electric bass to the forefront. Certainly, as compared to um, like rockabilly or country western, where you could use an upright and you know certainly get the job done. I know that I myself. Uh, changed i used to play accordion in the early 60s and when the beatles came out it was put away because like okay no yeah. we cannot do beatles music on the accordion and <laughs> I, I i believe that just that musical influence even without just the bass part um is a big part of what has created this evolution even with that the ratio of guitars to basses. Manufacturers are making 10 guitars for every bass that they make. It's We're still a great minority, but I think certainly it is greatly uh, important for there to be something for us instead of a footnote, because I agree. I have gone through, uh, usually it'll be a brand book, and you're right, there'll be a small chapter on whether it was the Gibson bass or whether it was, uh, you know. Um, but also, interestingly, we are, it, it's been kind of a spirit of innovation where you don't see us all playing Hofners because Paul did. So <laughs> there was some example there, but it also has had a kind of a mind of its own and has been moving along. And, and now... Um, one of the great debates that we see on our social media pages is the issue of more than four strings. Um, they, yeah. my, my bass brethren 
get rabid and tend to howl and bark whenever they see more than four strings. They're, they're tolerant of five, but when it comes to extended range and things, they, they're, they're getting just very excited. And these are areas where the instrument is growing in uncharted waters where some of them will go, oh, that's a harp. That's not a bass anymore. Um, yeah. as, as the book evolved, I, I know you, we build on the past, but as, as you're seeing the trends, how do you see the future of bass going? What, what, uh, what predictions, what thoughts do you have? Well, uh, yeah, cool. sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, t t Tony and I, when we were going to do the third edition, um, sat down to have our first discussion on how it had progressed from the second um, bout of writing. And basically we agreed that one has to have general trends. One can't talk about the odd guy who plays a 10 string or extended range or, um, and we were saying that actually in the last decade, in a lot of ways, the bass player has returned in relative anonymity to the back of the band. Mm -hmm. um, and because what happened over in the UK, strangely enough, after what I said about John uh, Entwistle, that is, the instrument was bought, brought to the forefront um, by the slapping era. And not necessarily the guys that were doing it in like Marcus Miller or uh, Lewis Johnson in the States. It was the fact that in England you had a band called Level 42 and Mark King who were doing six or eight nights at the Royal Albert Hall, chart-topping albums, hit singles, and the average guy in the street all of a sudden knew what a bass guitar was. And that's really what we found. That's why the Bass Centre was successful in the 80s. It was by no means because of our intent. It was completely fortuitous that this trend came along, got involved in popular music, and that's where it started. People then noticed the bass guitar. This then led on to five strings, six strings, extended range, blah de blah de blah 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 What we found to the present day is that the six-string bass is still specialist, as is eight, as is everything else. The five-string is here to stay. That's in the requisite of the guy who goes in the studio. He's got to have a passive Fender instrument, probably a, an active five. Uh, but other than that, the bass player has now retreated back again to the back of the band, often with a Fender bass. And uh, um, is not as high profile as he was when we started out writing in the first edition. I don't know if Tony would agree with that completely, but I think we do. Uh, pretty much, yeah. I mean, I was going to say about the well, the sort of five and six story was another thing that when we looked at when we first looked at what we were going to write about, we thought. How actually did that come about? How, how did the five and six thing come about? So we talked to Anthony Jackson, um, and you know he talked he talked at length as Anthony does about um, his uh, role with um, well quite a few makers really along the way. It's quite a complicated story. I remember <laughs> I remember that one being the one that I really had some trouble unraveling really and trying to tell in a, in a coherent way because it, it ducks and dives between different makers and different workshops and, and wide spacing and narrow spacing and, uh, and all the rest of it. Um, the other guy was Jimmy Johnson, um, uh, James, James Taylor probably best known for. Um, and he, he ordered a, a five, a low B five from Alembic uh, pretty early on. Um, so that, it was it was great to find out things like that where we just where Barry and I just sat down and thought what did happen? No, nobody no nobody seems to have sorted this out. You know? Or you know, people had talked to those guys in, in in isolation, but hadn't brought the whole story together and actually asked the question. You know how how did those extended bases come about? What was the purpose of them? And are they relevant now? You know what's what's 
the musical purpose, as a, as a friend of mine says. But, you know, the question is always, what's the musical purpose? And I think, you know, <laughs> well, like we were saying earlier, if, if perhaps if more more uh, makers had said that along the way and said, what's the musical purpose? Would, well, we wouldn't have had so many oddities to put in the book. So that maybe they, you know, maybe it was good that they did. But it, it, again, a very, very interesting story. And and one that I think, as Barry says, it's it's the five that has survived. And that's the one that, that really has become, an, for many players, an essential alongside the four. Um, as Tony has uh, alluded to, that's, as he said, that's the five with the low B, mm -hmm. as opposed to his predecessor, the five with the high C, which was just a 15 fret reading guitar uh, to read dots with. So obviously it did exist before. But Tony, you know, it's a very good point. Who's laying claim to actually that low B usage? And uh, it was really intriguing, exactly as Tony said, how many people lay claim to that, actually. Mm. Well, and I've had the opportunity to interview uh, some bassists that have actually uh, adapted a low B, but they're staying with four strings. And part of that had to do with neck width and hand size, so just the physicality of it. Um, but as, as we move on, also in the evolution of the instrument, uh, areas, I, I kind of see a main flow where many manufacturers are following, and I'll, I'm doing air quotes here, Barry, I know you can't see them, in a fender way. And so many manufacturers will make something and you kind of go, wow, that looks an awful like a fender, but it's not. And they've done tweaks to it, they've changed some things, but uh, unless you take a microscope and look closely, you can't really tell that it's not a fender. Um, that said, there are kind of at the far edges of our evolutionary tree, builders and luthiers that are kind of pushing the envelope, looking for alternatives, whether it be uh, the materials that they're building with. So we've seen uh, Aurium bases out of the Netherlands. It's a synthetic resin that's supposed to have a molecular structure similar to wood. It is milled out of one solid block, so there's no parts. Um, we've seen aluminum bases in combinations of the whole instrument. I saw some at the last NAMM show. There were some with aluminum necks that we were seeing in the past. Uh, carbon fiber in index. Um, I know it seems like a lot of these will come to the forefront and be no more than a fad. Um, while we still have wood, which is still a, a, a choice of excellence for everybody, um, kind of looking ahead, do you think that there will be a, a lot of, of changes in the future? Or are these just kind of experimental uh, trends like trying different food or something. Uh, Raul, Raul if, I could, if I could jump in on this, Raul, sure. we made reference to, and Tony and I sat down when we wrote the first book, exactly with reference to what you're talking about, that one guy was looking at all these alternatives and made a huge impact uh, in the industry is Ned Steinberger mm -hmm. and people look at Ned Steinberger and perhaps think of him for one uh, difference in design but he essentially developed um, and he instigated headless design uh, a lack of a body um, double ball end uh, stringing and he basically covered so many of the different options all at once because he was a furniture designer and not a musician who was, as you say, fender orientated. Mm -hmm. I laugh to this day that anybody with a slight inclination for guitar playing seems to be born with a DNA that includes a DuPont car color chart <laughs> and they sort of, you know, go ballistic as soon as they say, say foam green. And um, it, he 
in my opinion, and Tony and I talked about this a lot, deserved a great deal of credit because while Alembic were coming along with active electronics and coffee table finishes, the actual, um, not the shape, but the actual physicality of the instrument with the conventional head sock and tuners was always the same. Uh, and there were a lot of exotic builders starting to produce at that particular time. And when you consider that Ned Steinberger even designed the earliest Spectres with the, with the curved body, he was doing all that when we, before we even wrote the first edition. So with respect to all the chaps doing things now, Carbon Graphite's been around for years and years and years, which again, um, I think makes my point that the guy has returned to the back of the band. And this is why I said with a Fender bass. It's extraordinary what Leo got right. Yeah, absolutely. It's true. I mean, and I think that's, <laughs> it, it would be nice if that wasn't the case because there'd be more to write about. But we, <laughs> we, um, you know, we've, we've said. Be careful what you say here, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> what my client means to say. Um, <laughs> I mean, we, 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 let's put it this way, we said hello to, to, to find new things to put in, um, in this third edition, and we certainly have, and we've updated it, and we've improved the general look and feel of it, but it does come down to what Barry's saying, that um, I, I don't know how many times out of ten it is, but however many times, that's the number that, that people are seeing with a Fender or a Fender alike. And I think those those examples you were talking about, Raoul, that, that, you know, different materials and so on, and different approaches, um, different electronics, whatever it might be, lights up and down the fingerboard, it, 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 it kind of makes you want to pick up a P bass. You know, it really does. And, and that's, that's home for a lot, of, a lot of us, I think, really. It, it just feels right. Uh, that's very w well said, Tony. It is, it is home because basically after everybody's had a status or a Steinberger or everybody's tried carbon graphite for some strange reason, as you quite rightly say, they always gravitate back to that 34-inch scale, four or five string possibly, the 35-inch scale. And uh, Raul, this is... Um, it's it's almost as if 90% of people are just perfectly happy with that as a functioning instrument. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer the double bass, which is, what, which is what it replaced in the first place. I gotcha. Well, and there is certainly, uh, it's, it's not an understatement to say that there is a definite love affair with bassists and their instruments. Um, one of the things that we see also on our social media is the the lamenting of loves lost and a lot of times it's the musician is searching for that perfect bass had that fender um if they were lucky enough to get their hands on like a 1970 something p bass but in search of like the holy grail uh went to the pawn shop to get money to buy the next one up and then has forever regretted ever having let go of the old one to where now the manufacturers are making retro looking bases. And so, you know, you can buy a brand new instrument with a 50s headstock because you weren't fortunate enough to be there to get that one of the few that were made at the, at the time. Um, so it is, it is a kind of a complete circle. And again i know a lot of uh the luthiers that are pushing the envelope to make something different uh they they stand on the shoulders of that basic design and the characteristics that musicians look for so again i think certainly one of the most important things for our readership if you play bass you need to know your family history. You can't just wake up as, as an adult and go, I know nothing about my past or my family. It's, it's tragic like amnesia. So you, you, you very much need to get this book and get caught up 
and understand why you're even making some of the choices you're making today when you're migrating back to, you know, a P base or, or, you know, you're, you're looking into this so much ground has been covered and we're extraordinarily grateful. I speak for the base community in general to Tony and, and Barry for being the, the, the bearers, the, the, the torch bearers of our history. It is, it's such a, it is kind of like Jesuit monks having this duty of recording for posterity. Uh, we, are, we do see ourselves as Jesuit monks. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to tell that to someone in the pub tonight. <laughs> ask, ask if they can know, see your, your halo or your aura because it's, it's such a vital task, but it could very... I can see Barry's there, actually. Yeah. There you go. It, it could have very easily happened if nobody was paying attention to write down the details. You know, I, I, I guess it's like cavemen finally drawing on their walls so that people knew what, what they did. And so this is an essential thing. So definitely, Tony, Barry, thank you so much for making time out of your busy schedule to share your insight. Again, the bass book, a complete illustrated history of bass guitars. You play bass, this needs to be in your library. And very easy to find at a, at a bookstore online. Um, you have no excuse for not having this book. Thank you very much, gentlemen. You've seen this live Skype interview. My, my friends here in the UK, here we are in the great Northwest in Portland, Bass Musician Magazine.